Stories of werewolves stretch back into humankind's deep, dark history from multiple different cultures, particularly those cultures I assume lived around a lot of wolves. Take ancient Greek mythology, for example, where you have the king Lycaon who fed his butchered son to Zeus to test the god's omnipotence. As punishment for Lycaon's savagery, Zeus turned him into a wolf, a shape which was considered to be more fitting for Lycaon's bestial nature. In Norse mythology, I read a story about a man and his son who discover wolf pelts outside a cottage that, when worn, transformed them both into wolves for 10 days. And during that time, the son gives in to his savagery and kills 11 men at once, invoking his father's wrath, and the two of them clash. The son almost killed in the conflict. He is saved from death by one of Odin's ravens, and they both decide to take the pelts off on the 10th day, meaning that they're both cured of being werewolves. Werewolf, in the modern context, is a word derived from Old English, where were means man, and wolf means wolf. Man-wolf. In modern movies and pop culture, werewolves and lycanthropes have become a horror classic. My name is Ben Byrne, and this is how to make lycanthropes and werewolves truly formidable as encounters for your D&D 5e campaign. Duality is inherent to the werewolf myth. Often a werewolf is a perfectly reasonable person when human. Even the hero of their own story, once transformed, most often a werewolf has very little control over their monstrous selves and will inevitably violently kill. The decision for a werewolf is how they cope with their monstrousness and how that theme of duality plays out. Is the humane part of a werewolf tortured by their curse, made a villain by the tragedy of their circumstances? Or has the werewolf found a way to be at peace with their transformation through meditation and- Do the breathing, do the breathing. Count to 10, mate. Come on. Other coping methods such as locking themselves in a deep dark room whenever there's a full moon. Or has a werewolf embraced their monstrousness and are completely unrepentant of their crimes, considering their transformation a powerful gift? Are they in fact more monster than man? Playing with this duality allows you to add complexity to the werewolf stories which you're going to tell with your player characters. And the party will need to grapple with questions of innocence and culpability. Lycanthropy can afflict anyone, but it is a curse, so sorry. I have to. And introduce some of that greyness that dark fantasy narratives are really known for. Can your party find justice if the killer literally can't help themselves? They're cursed to inflict violence onto others. Or are the werewolves in your campaign just a metaphor for humanity's inner monster? Of course, to bring about any justice, first you must be able to identify your werewolves. And the fact that werewolves can pass completely for human makes the werewolf a right monster to run a witch hunt style tale in your D&D campaign, which are perfect for dark fantasy as well because of the greyness of those narratives. This can play with themes of duality and complex morality. Are the true monsters those that live out in the woods and prey on those that stray from the path? Or are the folks running the trial and seeding paranoia trying to root out the werewolves the actual villains of your story? You could also run a great mystery with a pack of werewolves as your villain, especially if you start from a place of not even mentioning werewolves. The moment you mention werewolves, your player characters will start to reach for the silver. And so if you just step back a few paces and say there's been an animal torn to shreds or a victim torn to shreds in the woods, we don't know what monster has done this. The party might think it was an owlbear or a wyvern or something to begin with. And through investigation, they learn that the monster might actually be living inside of the village. And then once they figured out it's a werewolf, they start to reach for their silver and, and whatever else. And finally, on a theme, werewolves have an innate connection to nature that similar monsters just kind of don't. While vampires and liches are often portrayed as a perversion of nature, as disgusting undead that have cheated death, werewolves are sometimes even portrayed as nature spirits that might protect a forest. They might be dark, evil nature spirits that prey on the more innocent ones. Even 
even if they are considered savage, they fit within the ecosystem of a forest much more seamlessly than many other monsters. And so werewolves could represent the wilderness invading into civilization. The woods are dangerous and folks are told not to venture off the road. And so for the most part, they don't. But what happens if the forest comes in and starts invading the village? That's the sort of narrative you could play out with werewolves. And of course, lycanthropes in D&D needn't just be a wolf, where rats, where boars, and the formidable where bear all are represented within the D&D monster manual. These creatures can be just as fearsome as werewolves in the right context, but honestly, you might want to keep on more predatory style monsters for your lycanthropes to transform into. Where rats and where ravens make for great spies of the forest, where boars or even where rams can make for great beastman style foot soldiers. And of course, the were bear can make for a truly terrifying berserker style monster with a reputation of being impossible to kill. So with those themes in mind, the themes of duality, humanity versus monstrousness, of paranoia that anybody could be a werewolf, and with the wilderness and nature and werewolves sort of representing that, how will you represent lycanthropes in your D&D campaign? For example, in Grim Hollow, lycanthropy is a curse passed on by a were-creature's bite, which is pretty common to the mythology. It is unambiguously quite monstrous. Lycanthropes need to learn how to contain their savage instincts or else they will unleash uncontrolled violence onto others. However, some druidic circles, including the Red Claws of Kandar in the north of Etheris, perform rituals called the Lunar Sacrament to give themselves greater strength in defending the wilds and defeating their foes, willingly turning themselves into lycanthropes. But this is an excruciatingly painful ordeal to go through. Such druids have learned to control their curse through meditation and balance, and perhaps this could be the backstory of your druidic character, just using wild shape as a mechanical way of representing your lycanthropy. However, werewolves don't need to fit into that fairly defined modern description for your D&D campaign. How is the curse of lycanthropy passed on in your campaign? Is it purely via bite? Can it be given via a curse which is cast like a spell? Are your werewolves skinwalkers who wear the pelts of the animals that they can transform into, doing so willingly to defend the wilds around their village? Or are your werewolves more like wargs from uh, Game of Thrones, where they sort of mentally move into the mind of the animals that are around them? Can lycanthropy only be acquired via birth, more like a fantasy lineage? Or is it given only if the werewolf intends to give lycanthropy to whoever it bites? This is something that I use during a campaign to stop the whole D&D &D party turning into lycanthropes in encounters? Are there different types of werewolves? Are they delineated by animal forms? And are there political rivalries between factions such as the were-bears and the were-rats and the were-ravens and the were-wolves all don't really get along very well? Is lycanthropy truly a monstrous thing only sought by the evil and suffered by the afflicted? Lone wanderers whose only reprieve from the nightmarish existence that they have inherited is the trans that they enter whenever they are transformed. Altering the werewolf mythology can, as ever, surprise your players and create unexpected styles of encounter if werewolves don't behave exactly as your players expect them to based on the most common modern mythologies. Which brings me to silver. <laughs> Werewolves are of course famous for their complete immunity to all physical damage, except for silver, which is in the T's and C's of being a werewolf. Also magical weapons in Dungeons and Dragons, which, you know, I don't really like the concept that once a weapon is magical, then it overcomes a lot of immunities and weaknesses, but that's a separate video. In my opinion, werewolves should not be represented like superheroes. I don't think that normal arrows should bounce off them and swords bend when someone tries to fight a werewolf with a mundane weapon. That doesn't quite capture a dark fantasy atmosphere for me. Nor do I think that silver should burn and sizzle a werewolf's flesh uh, when it comes 
into simple contact. And let me explain why. The way that I like to run werewolf weaknesses in a dark fantasy campaign is that a mundane sword can still pierce their skin and a hammer will still break their bones. But these injuries are fleeting and instantly healed, inflicting no real damage to the werewolf. They're sort of functionally immune rather than literally immune. And then you can bring the horror of werewolves into your descriptions to the players, describing how grievous wounds such as a stab to the gut knits itself closed or a dislocated shoulder just snaps and crunches its way back into place. That feels much more dark fantasy to me than them being Superman or Shazam. On the flip side, silver isn't dangerous for a werewolf to just simply touch. And the reason I removed that specific sizzly, skin burning, effective silver on werewolves is because it creates a, a greater mystery for the players to have to grapple with, right? Silver, when used against a werewolf, creates a wound that is not healed instantly. They can't recover like Wolverine from attacks that are inflicted by silver, which could be a magical or even alchemical effect in your or d, d campaign. But what this does is removes an easy way for the players to quickly root out hiding werewolves from a population by lining everybody up and taking a silver coin and touching it to everybody's palm. They have to stab everybody with a silver dagger and the town guard probably aren't gonna let the player characters go around stabbing everyone with silver. Maybe your werewolves uh, can control how quickly they heal from mundane damage so that they can fake a wound if they need to and then they can heal it later, but it still does no functional damage. You know, even if they've been stabbed through the heart, they can still walk around and function and survive that until that wound has a chance to close up. If a party member tries to decapitate a werewolf, maybe you describe how the axe goes into their neck, but it doesn't take the head clean off. And no matter how much hacking is done away at that neck, it won't take the neck clean off and the wound will eventually close up and heal itself within a couple of moments. All of this kind of like gory body horror, I think is much more ripe for dark fantasy. No silver sizzly flesh. It just means they can't heal their wounds and weapons don't bounce off them. They inflict damage that heals quickly. Let's take a look at the mechanics that will bring your werewolves to life in your campaign. And let's look at the base werewolf stat block, which is crap. Look, it's it's just disappointingly underpowered. This is a monster that I think deserves to be a boss monster in its own right. I think that it deserves to be able to hold an entire party at bay. And the base stat block for the werewolf is only CR3. It's got pretty meager attacks. It can only attack twice a turn and the biggest sin of all is that shape changing takes an entire action. Straight up asterisk for every other stat block that I mention here, shape changing should be a bonus action for every lycanthropic stat block. It is no fun to fight a lycanthrope unless it becomes a monstrous hybrid during the fight. And it's no fun allowing the player characters to all just wail damage on the werewolf twice while it uses its turn just to to transform. I look at the base werewolf stat block kind of like the equivalent of a vampire spawn stat block. It's maybe a werewolf that's only just changed and coming to grips with its transformation. It works better for a pack of minions for a more powerful foe, such as a werewolf alpha or a werebear or possibly even a druid or a vampire. In this circumstance, I'd even consider adding pack tactics to this group because wolves have pack tactics and that just kind of makes sense to me for making werewolves more formidable. The lycanthropes listed in Grim Hollow's Monster Grimoire are much better for posing a greater threat as boss monster style creatures for your party to fight and, and they can hold their own a bit more. The werewolf Ravager gets to grapple targets with successful attacks and any target that it has grappled it has advantage on attack rolls against it and does an extra d6 of damage which creates a very visceral image of my mind of a werewolf who's pounced on somebody, grabbed onto them with their teeth, ripping them around like a chew toy and tearing into them with their claws. It's quite a horrific image and it also mechanically means that they can do quite a bit more damage to a party member on their own. The werebear aesthetic has access to spell casting, which can help the werebear's reputation for really high durability. It has the ability to heal itself as a bonus action with healing word and it can dispel magic, making magic less of a paper to a 
lycanthropes rock, if you know what I mean. Magic tends to be this kind of gotcha against lycanthropes because they're resistant or immune to most mundane types of damage, and so wizards do really well against lycanthropes, and the werebear ascetic's access to magic can help blunten this weapon of the wizards a little bit more. The lore of the werebear ascetic suggests that it is a being more at peace with its monstrous side, able to control its transformations more than other lycanthropes, making it an excellent druidic forest guardian type adversary. Perhaps maybe it's part of a druidic cult and is the leader that the party have to contend with if they want to move through a specific part of the forest. Adding some legendary actions to either of these Grim Hollow stat blocks could make them truly formidable as lycanthropic threats for your party members to have to contend with. But my absolute favourite stat block for representing a truly monstrous and nightmarish werewolf is the Werewolf Alpha. I found this homebrew on Pinterest a couple years ago. You might have seen it before yourself. It's by a creator whose name is Stone Strix, and I'll throw their name somewhere here. And if you are Stone Strix, uh, maybe reach out and I can provide a link. The Werewolf Alpha has so much going for it to make it able to be a really formidable boss monster. It has legendary resistances. It has Pack Leader, which gives advantage on attacks to other lycanthropes. It has an AC of 16, making it an actual contest as to whether or not it is hit with an attack roll. It has three attacks on its turn, each of which do a weighty amount of damage. And it has legendary actions, which do the most work in making this thing really savage for your players to have to contend with. Its legendary actions allow it to keep mobile without provoking attacks of opportunity, which allow it to sort of hit and run. It can pounce on a party member and maybe even drag them off into the woods or run away itself and continue to jump scare the party from different angles. It can bark orders to move other lycanthropes around. So if it is hunting with a pack, it can send its werewolf minions to attack the spellcasters in the back so that they can't get away with just casting spells at their own whim. And best of all, it has a frenzy ability, which means that it can make a melee attack against every creature within five feet of it, which can be a lot of attacks that can do a lot of damage. And it represents the sheer violence that a werewolf can unleash upon its foes. I ran the werewolf alpha to great success a couple of years ago. It was in this labyrinthian like cave and the human side of the lycanthrope had filled the cave with traps. And this stat block held at bay a level 6 party entirely on its own. It could attack from the shadows before darting away, leading the fighters and the paladins into the traps that it had set earlier. And then once the party was sort of semi-spread out, it could pounce on pockets of party members and unleash a terrifying amount of damage before trying to slink away again before the fighters could come back and, and come to grips with it. And if you time it right, it can run up on a group of party members, unleash three attacks, and then as its legendary action at the end of the next turn, unleash another fury, flurry uh, rather, of attacks onto those same party members, doing huge amounts of damage. And that is how to make werewolves truly formidable in your D&D campaign. I hope you found some of these tips useful. If you did, make sure to follow the channel and give this video a like because we are back. We've been away for a little while, but we are back now doing a new video every week. And if you want to learn how to make other monsters formidable for your dark fantasy D&D campaign, why not check out this video we did about vampires if you really want to challenge your party with gothic horror monsters, or if one of your player characters or you yourself want to play a monster hunter who hunts these monsters down, check out this video where we talk about our new class for D&D 5e, the aptly named Monster Hunter.